So after doing my episode with Dr. Paul Offit on a balanced approach to combating COVID-19, I get a text message from a colleague out west saying, did you know that Child Protective Services calls are down significantly? And I tell myself, I, I guess that's good. But then he later explains that this is down because people aren't able to report the amount of abuse that's happening at home. You know, normally the kids would be presenting at school or to their coaches. They don't have that venue. Now they're at home with their abuser with no outs. And when I heard that, I was like, wow, we got to better address this. We got to, we got to bring attention to this because these are our kids and the impact that that's going to have on them is not just temporary. It's, it's the rest of their lives. It's generational. And so this is what's inspired episode 33. We had Dr. Michelle Ward, associate professor and division head of child and youth protection through the university of Ottawa and uh, the children's hospital here in Ottawa, because this is too important. And, and she is an amazing advocate for, for the kids. She is, she is well published. She's a journalist and she's produced videos on how we could better serve our kids. And the one video that we'll have links to on the show notes saying, be that one person, be that person that the kid can open up to and connect with in a time of need, which really was, was such a, 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 beautiful message when you see this video. So thanks for tuning in. I know this is a tough topic, but it's so important. And at the end of the day, and when you listen to this, it leaves you with, with hope that we can do better, that we can connect with the kids out there. We can reach out to families in need and we could overcome not only now during a pandemic, but even post pandemic when we know that there's a lot of people that need help. So without further ado, Dr. Michelle Ward. Ladies and gentlemen, we got Dr. Michelle Ward, Division Head for Child and Youth Protection, Department of Pediatrics. Thank you so much for joining us on the show. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. I, I love what you're doing. She's a, you're also a journalist and I've been following your, your your articles and they've been super informative of in terms of what are obstacles are in terms of dealing with child maltreatment and and welfare at this time. So maybe in general terms, Michelle, what what is our what are the concerns with our children's welfare at this time? So there are a couple of things that I think it's important for people to know. The first is that uh, child maltreatment, which is child abuse and neglect, is already really common. And we know before the pandemic that a lot of families were struggling. But with the addition of the COVID-19 pandemic and social distancing and isolation and really families just being home together, it's changed everything. I mean, it's changed things for me. I'm a mom as well, and I'm trying to work. But, you know, for those that have been hit hard, they might have lost their job. Their stress levels may be way higher. They may have already been reliant on some services on their, in their community to help them, whether it's to get food into their homes or to have counseling services, or even just to have a break to have the kids go out to school and let the parents do mm -hmm. what they need to do. So we know because of all these things changing that it actually increases the risk uh, for you know, bad things happening in the home for kids being maltreated, for people losing their patience, and also for there not to be any eyes on what's going on. And that's the, the really scary thing to me is, you know, normally, and correct me if I'm wrong, like teachers, coaches, these are the people that are, that often will report evidence of, of abuse. And right now that's, not an option. Yeah, exactly. I mean, even just for families that are doing well all the time and don't have these issues, I always say to them, it's really good for your kids to have three different environments, their home, their school, and somewhere else, whether it's a team or a faith community or a cultural community or whatever it is. And that's because things aren't always going well at home or at mm -hmm. school. And then that's protective. 
but even more so at this time, you know, kids rely on a lot of those relationships, especially with their teachers and their peers at school. And teachers actually make about a third of reports to uh, child protection or child welfare mm. agencies. So in particular, in the first month of the pandemic, there was really very little contact between schools and kids. There's increasing contact now, but it's not the same virtually, I think, especially for kids. No, and, and I'd imagine, for, especially the teachers, like there's some, you some of this, you would need to get an impression by seeing the kid and having time for things to, like that conversation to be able to develop. And like, uh, by no means am I an expert in this, and I, I don't want to pretend to know, but I would imagine it would be much more helpful actually physically seeing the kid to see if there's any evidence of maltreatment. Yeah, I don't know that we have scientific evidence about that, but, you know, kids are all mm. about connection. And you mm. can't force that connection. As you know, when your kids come home from school, a lot of parents complain. They say, you know, how was your day? And the kids basically don't tell them anything. They say it was fine. Right? <laughs> but when do you get that information? You get that information when everyone's relaxed, you're driving in the car, or you're giving them a rub on the back at bedtime, or you're just sitting and playing and conversation flows. And it's the mm -hmm. same thing with teachers, right? It's creating that safe, comfortable, time to just kind of connect, which I think is a lot harder to do right now. Absolutely. And so I guess, Michelle, is there evidence that this is becoming more of a concern? Like I know on paper, this definitely seems like this would like, this is something to worry about, you know, like, you know, like we mentioned, there's no coaching, no, no teachers laying eyes on our, on our, our, our children. But is there anything to imply that this is worse right now during COVID? There are a couple of things that I think are important in that. The first is that you probably have heard that the kids help phone has had a really big increase in the number of calls that they're getting. So much so that there was an announcement by the federal government to increase their increase their funding. So when I spoke with them a few weeks ago, they told me they normally have about 2,000 volunteers. And in the space of a couple of weeks, they were planning to train 2,000 more because of the increase in wow. volume. So wow. yeah, they were seeing at that time about a 300% increase in calls. And while a lot of those calls are questions about social distancing and social isolation and how kids are struggling with that, they said about 25% also related to um, child abuse. Wow. That, oh, that breaks my heart. Cause you know, I, I, one of the articles that I read was hearing that, you know, child protective services calls or involvement has come down significantly. And, and, and when you read that on the surface, you're like, okay, you know, maybe things are less of a, a problem, but I think it's just a sign that there's less reporting. You know, there isn't that avenue that is normally there to for us to be able to identify these issues. Man, that's scary. Yeah, absolutely. When I talk to people across the country, pretty consistently, everyone's reporting that their calls, their new calls for concerns of abuse are down about 30 to 40%. One place told me 55%. Mm -hmm. That was the highest that I had heard. And that's across the board. That's to child welfare agencies or children's aid societies. It's also to police. And in the hospital, we are seeing very few kids because most of those kids come to our attention because of child welfare services or teachers or police or other people. Wow. That's, like I said, that is ultra scary. And I, I mean, this is why we're having this conversation. I, I think I really, collectively, our group really wanted to be able to increase the awareness so we could like have solutions here. but. One thing that we talked about beforehand, I, which I thought was worth bringing bringing up as well, is even pre COVID. Like, what what's the incidence of of abuse or maltreatment in our community? Yeah, so I think this will be a surprise to most people, but it is actually very common in Canada. The data, so there's some Canadian data from a population survey that shows us that one third of adults say that as children they experienced some kind of abuse or exposure to really significant violence in their homes growing up. 
So one in three is a huge number. If we look at kind of the statistics that are collected by child welfare agencies and researchers that look at that kind of data, it's about 2%. So two of 100 kids, somebody makes a report to child welfare. There's enough to investigate it. And there's enough information at the end of that to confirm that there was some kind of abuse or neglect of that child. Mm. So even if it's that number, which we think is a gross underestimate, that's two of 100, which is actually more common than almost everything else we study in medicine. And we know that these things have long-term health consequences. So, you know, in the past, people, I think, really thought this was kind of a social problem, um, which it is very closely tied to a lot of our difficulties socially, but it's also really Mm -hmm. closely tied to kids' physical and mental health, which is why people like me in the medical system as well um, care about it and try to work in this area. Wow. I mean, for us, it was really driven by, you know, we had early in our episodes, we had a conversation with Dr. Adrian Matheson about some of the long-term effects of of kids that are, you know, been abused or mal, received maltreatment. And it's, it's scary because like we talked about this too, like it's not just one kid at times. It could be generational when, when something like this happens. Like we know that a kid that's been abused is more likely to abuse their own children and, you know, alcohol abuse, mental illness, the, the, the physical side as well. Like we just see such massive downstream effects from, from, from such action. So it's, it just, it, it breaks my heart. I keep saying that, but it just, I mean, once you start having kids to it, you just look at things a little bit differently and, I, you know, we are, our group is highly motivated to try and, you know, do something about it. And, and right now we're trying to increase awareness and hopefully we'll come up with some solutions and we'll, we'll talk about that too here. But I got to ask Michelle, like, how do you do this? Like, I, I, I can't watch one of these, like, I don't know, a commercial about something like this. And and then you're seeing these kids, you're seeing the kids that have been physically abused, uh, m- m- mentally abused, like all forms. And you, you still show up, you still do your thing. And what, what, where do you find that energy? Where do you find that drive? Like, cause I, th- I truly feel like you got to be a special human being to do what you do. <laughs> Well, I I think people end up in fields because uh, for some reason and they it's something that they care about and they can just do for some reason. But for me, you know, I think it's different than what people imagine it is, to be honest. I mm. see kids who are physically abused. I see kids who are sexually abused. I see kids who are profoundly neglected. And some of them have really terrible outcomes, especially the very young ones, for example, that have a devastating head injury or multiple fractures or these kinds of things. But having done this for more than 15 years, I can honestly say that I can count on one hand the number of times that it seemed that, you know, the parents kind of set out to harm their child. So almost Mm -hmm. always, these and it's not just the kids I work with I work with the families too a lot of the time Mm. and almost always there are people who love their kids and they want to do right by them and they're just struggling in other ways and so sometimes they're not able to do what needs to be done for their child and I think Mm -hmm. that's one of the important messages that you know we just need to be compassionate and we need to reach out to empathy to these folks, because the more we vilify and other families that are really struggling, the easier it is to not talk about these issues, to think about that these are families that are not like us, that don't live in our communities, you know, that we really don't need to spend the time and energy on. And that's just not true. It's this hits across all socioeconomic groups. It hits in my neighborhood. It's in your neighborhood. <laughs> I think people would be really surprised at the kinds of people that, that I see in my work. Uh, and I think it just reflects that parenting is really hard. And we expect a lot of parents. We don't provide really great supports a lot of the time to parents that are struggling. 
And that's not to excuse things that are happening in the home that shouldn't be happening. It doesn't excuse it at all. But on the other hand, if we want to find solutions, we need to look at these as people who need some help and not be afraid to to talk about it, which is one of the things that's actually been super interesting to me about the pandemic, that I've been doing this work, as I say, for over 15 years. And I have, you know, I teach about this, I speak about this. And I can tell you when I'm on a conference program, and there's a series of workshops that you can choose from, people aren't choosing the child abuse workshop most of the time, right? (laughs) or webinars or whatever it is. People don't want to talk about this. They don't want to hear about it. Mm-hmm. They think that they're either not going to see it or that they, they just, it's not comfortable. They don't want to talk about it. But in this pandemic, that's one of the things that's been super interesting to me is that people are willing to talk about it. I think because we're all experiencing some challenges and it's pretty clear to see why families that are already struggling might be struggling even more. Yeah, M- Michelle, I mean, absolutely agree with everything you're throwing down the point you make though about you know the intentions of a lot of these parents i think is an important one and because you know i'm a human being too i if i hear about uh, a a kid being abused you know my, my thoughts are like how dare these parents and and like who are these evil people and you know it's often it's as you as you said they're they're struggling it's it's their their true intention is not to harm the child it's just you know it's the stressors of life it's the lack of connection it's 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 all these kind of things adding up and i think it's an important message because to want to help you got to really see the human side of our of of people. And so I think that's a, that's a very, very important message that you, you just said. So no, I want to thank you for that, but it's true. It, it, it might, there's a lot of positives we could take from the pandemic, but if increasing the awareness of, of, of child abuse and child maltreatment is one of them, then, Hey, you know, let's not, let's not, for, let's not take this for granted. So solutions, we we talked about this offline and it was one of the things that really got me excited because one of the things that we try and, and promote on the show is just, you know, solutions that are achievable and scalable and can act, and can make a difference. Often they could just be a nudge or, or whatnot. But Michelle, do you mind just diving into like some of the things that you suggest that we could do to reduce the amount of child maltreatment? I think there's a lot that we can do. At the same time, I think that there are a lot of challenges in this. So maybe if I start at sort of the individual level, because that's a question that I've been getting a lot during the pandemic by just people generally, what can I do? I'm reading about this and what can I do? And to the general public, I say to them, that the best thing that people can do is just be a good neighbor, have their eyes and their ears open, and look at people with empathy. And if they're, you know, I think we've already been asked to be good neighbors around maybe older folks that are in our neighborhoods and that might be isolated and need some help getting groceries, for example. And I think We have to think about kids and youth as individuals as well, not just as a member of their family, because sometimes that family is not able to provide what that child needs. So just reaching out and to kids that you know, youth that you know, families that you know, especially if you think that they might be struggling. It's basic stuff that I think everyone knows how to do. You know, if there's a a family at home with lots of little kids and they look like they're having a hard time, just saying it must be really hard to be at home with your kids all the time. Is there anything I can do to help? Or is there anything that you need? And I know that doesn't sound like a lot, but I think just like lots of other problems, it's really about connecting and reaching out and making people feel that they have somewhere to go if they have a concern. I wouldn't want anyone to think that it's their job to investigate child abuse. It's it's not. And so we have to be careful about that, but just being good neighbors, having our ears and eyes open, offering help if that if there's a way to do that. 
And then if you are concerned that there's something going on with a child that is causing harm or has the potential to cause harm, every single citizen in Canada actually has a legal obligation to report that. So most people think that it's just professionals that have that obligation, but the legislation actually says that it's all people. So making a call to child welfare services in your community to just say what you've seen or heard, and then it's their job to figure out if they even need to do anything about that. So those are the things that I think people can do in their own communities. For parents, this is a hard time. And I think it's we all have to recognize that all parents get frustrated, all parents lose their patience, all kids have their moments, and that's okay. And that that's okay to talk about that. And it's also okay to say, I need help. And I don't think we really create a lot of space for parents to do that a lot of the time. So as more services come back online, I think that'll help too. But there are places that parents can reach out and and get the kind of help that they might need. So I think those are some basic things that we can do. For professionals like teachers or coaches or music teachers or dance teachers or people who are, you know, FaceTiming in or Zooming in or talking to families, it's sort of the same message, just keeping this in your mind that things might not be going as well as you think and just asking in an empathetic way, just connecting and saying, how are things at home? Is there, you know, is there anything you're worried about? Is there anything I can help you with? It seems like nothing, but to the people that I talk to who have been through really hard times with child abuse and neglect, every single time I talk to one of those youth or adults who found support, they tell me the story of one person. And that could have been a coach or a teacher or an aunt or an uncle or a friend And what they say is that person just asked me. They asked at the right time, in the right way. They listened and they cared. And that's what led led to the help that I needed. So I think we can all be, we can all be that one person for a child. And it's, you know, it's that principle of it, it takes a village. It takes a village even now when we have to do it virtually. So that's what I say in general to to people um, who don't have a specific role in this. Wow. I I don't know why that makes me a little bit emotional with that. Just be the right person. Like just be, maybe it's just picturing that, that child opening up to that person that was, you know, making themselves available, making themselves present, allowing them to connect in that moment. And that being a lifelong memory and and potentially impact how things how their life looks for the forevermore and what i also think is important from what you're saying michelle is that this is all something that we could we can do you know it's just something that we we could make that time i don't care how busy like you and i we're busy cats we're hustling all the time but there's always room for this and, uh, you know, we talk about some of the posit- positive outcomes of, of such a horrible, you know, pandemic and, and COVID-19. And, and maybe at the end of this all, it's, we, we do feel more connected. We do, we do have that better sense of community and, and maybe things like this can, we can improve this, these situations. Cause to me, I can't reinforce it enough. It's just, it's just too important. It's our kids, man. You know what I mean? If you can't represent, we, I mean, you got to represent for the kids. That's, that's all I. That's all I'm saying. It's just, it's too important. Wow. A couple other things I think would be good to to touch base on. I I, I want to like we have a my nephew's special needs. He's got neuromuscular syndrome, and I think it's worth acknowledging anyway. Like how challenging. A time this must be for for a lot of the special needs families. Uh, I wonder if you could maybe comment to that uh, on what we're seeing or or anything that you think might be helpful. Yeah, this is such a difficult time, as I said before, for parents generally, but in particular, 
there are certain groups that are even more challenged, I guess I would say. And there are lots of families that have kids that really require 24 seven, very intensive care by their parents. And they struggle at the best of times. And we, as you know, our systems don't always support them maybe as much as they need. And now those systems are not in place in the same way. So I'm hearing from families, but also from professionals like doctors who work with kids with complex medical needs, for example, you know, they might have a feeding tube overnight that parents have to stay up or check multiple times through the night every night. Or they might have behavioral challenges during the day and the parent literally cannot leave their side. And now they're doing that 24 seven with the child not being able to go to school, with them not being able to get respite services, for example. So some of these families have people that come into the home to help with that, or the kids may go out of the home, for example, for a weekend night to give the parents a chance to sleep and recuperate so that they can do their best again for that child the following week, right? And so that is actually one of the big groups that I'm worried about, and we're starting to see the impact of that. In fact, in my discussions with the local child welfare agency, I'm hearing that there are some kids now that are coming into care really only because the parents don't have the supports they need to care for those kids at this time. Not because they can't and not because they don't want to, but because it's really impossible to do it 24 seven without supports. Wow. Wow. So you know, there's a lot of advocacy going on right now around during this time of pandemic that respite services, for example, be one of the next things that comes back online, not just mm-hmm. because parents need a break, but because it actually means that families can break down and that that connection can be lost for a period of time and the trauma that that causes for both the parent and the child, that's going to be a lot more difficult for them, costly for them and costly for our systems. So there are things right now that need to happen around supporting those parents who really have extraordinary demands on them and who for the most part just do it and don't ask for a lot, but we need to be advocating for them. Oh, I, I, I think it's such an important point, Michelle. I, I think you know, we're, we're recording this on May 1st, uh, 2020. And, you know, in Ontario, in Ottawa, you know, we've shown evidence of a curve that's flattened. And I think it's important to have this conversation about those next steps, you know, in terms of where are the needs now? And once again, as you so gracefully put, you know, if those families are strained, it's, it's, that's not just uh you know something that's going to impact them for those days it's could have a lifelong implications costly implications emotional implications you know hospitalization implications so it's a it's an important thing to bring up it's an important thing to advocate for cuz there this conversation about how you know i i, I was on the did a cbc uh, news article yesterday or day before and basically talking about like what are the next steps you know like it's you know it'd be nice to get that kind of clear map you know and this is definitely something that i would want to see or we would want to see being advocated for such an important point yeah and i think it it speaks to the issue that you know uh, imagine a parent having to choose to give up their child because then their child can get the services that they need you imagine that bullshit? No, like, oh, like what a horrible spot to put a family in. Yeah, and, and it's you know? happening oh. now around those issues. But this happens actually at other times too. That the way that a lot of our systems work is that you know kids can get certain services if they're in care, for example. But we can't mm-hmm. provide those services to the family to keep the child in the home. So you know, we really have to think hard about how we support families and what they actually need 
especially, like I said, when they have these extraordinary demands on them. You know, the other group that I'm worried about right now is the, mm. the newborns and, and infants. And anyone who has kids knows what it's like to have that new baby and how mm. much work it is. And again, at this time, you know, people, this might be a first baby. This might be somebody that doesn't have a lot of support. They're going home and they can't have any support. They can't have a grandparent or yeah. a friend or whomever come in and help them, right? And public health up until now hasn't been able to go into the homes either. We have a system to have people go in and help parents, which has not been happening. And I know that it is going to be starting to happen again. Mm. But that's, an, you know, everybody who's had a child knows how hard that period is, right? <laughs> You're not sleeping, yes. you barely can grab a shower, you might not be eating well, and now we're asking people to do that isolated and completely alone. And, yeah. and from the work that I do, when things happen and the child is very young, if a, a child is injured, that can have devastating long-term consequences. Mm. So that's another group wow. we really need to focus on. Wow. So, I mean... Maybe a call to action too, like we've mentioned that everyone's doing our best to connect, but you know, certainly if you know some first time parents out there, maybe it's a good time to just FaceTime, pick up the phone, text, say, what's up? Cause I mean, we could all speak to it. It's not that long ago when we had our first and we were like, what the hell is happening? <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, are we ever going to sleep again? Why is he always crying? So yeah, and and you could imagine. I mean, I, I, we don't need to map it out, but like, babies sh being shaken, babies being neglected. Like, uh, you know, you could see that happening if there isn't that support. Wow, Michelle, I gotta tell you, this has been so helpful, so important. And I'm so glad we got a chance to connect and do this. Any last thoughts or or messages that you want the public or listeners to to bounce with? I think the one other thing that I've been thinking about is that a lot of our systems are really siloed around what kids need and what adults need. And when we talk about families, a lot of the time providing what the parent needs is actually what's best for the child. And so as a pediatrician, that's something that's always a bit frustrating to me, I would say. So a child comes in and their parent is struggling, the child might not be getting what they need. There's some you know, some things that need to happen. The parent might be struggling with mental health issues or addictions or just needs some supports of some kind. And I can't access that by and large, right? What I can do is assess the child and speak about what issues they have and what they might need. And I think that's true across our systems. Child welfare has a certain amount of sway in terms of getting parents help but their job is protecting the child. And I hear the same from parents that they go places to get services for themselves. And those services can't really link with what their child needs only with what the parent mm -hmm. needs. And so I think if we're thinking at a more of a system level, we talk about families, but we don't talk about families in terms of a practical way of how do we get all the pieces in a row for all the people in the family to make things better in an easy way. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what the solution is to that, but I would say that the more that the, the more that we can encourage kind of the, in medicine anyway, the adult and the pediatric side to work together, which family medicine does a lot better than other areas of medicine, but not just in medicine, in the other systems that are out there, you know, if teachers are noticing that parents are struggling, they don't have a way to get those parents some support either, right? All they can do mm. is say, you know, talk to them about what their child needs. So I think that's a, a actually a really big barrier uh, for us to look at kids and youth in that way and to look at parents separately. And if there's some way to bring that closer together, that when we talk about policies for parents, it's not just 
putting more money into their pockets, which is super important. But it's about how do we actually assess what each of the people in the family needs and then provide mm-hmm. it in a practical way. A hundred percent. Like that theme of silos comes up over and over again on our show. It is one of the key obstacles to having high quality care in in my humble opinion. And as you mentioned, there's not, I don't know exactly how the, the, what the solutions are. I will say that one of the initiatives we started, I think was, has been a good model for that with the bridges over barriers. It's a charity we did to to try and support at risk youth and, and social workers without having red tape can address family needs. So it's basic needs, mind you, but if they need diapers, if they need a bus pass, if the kid needs shoes, they can execute, you know, I, and I think that that's a, that's a helpful approach, but at a higher level, I could not agree more. We need to be less siloed. We need to see our patients, our people, our, our, our citizens as a whole. And the second we start doing that, the second we can provide higher, higher quality care for sure, for sure. So yeah, once again, Michelle Ward, thank you so much for doing the show. You are one of our, I'm going to say this, walking angels. You gonna you do this kind of work. I don't care what anybody has to say. You have to be, you got some wings behind you there. So I, I really appreciate it. I really appreciate the time and keep plugging. And we're going to do our best to support you. There's, we have some initiatives coming through the pipeline we, I'm not, I don't want to jinx us, so we're not gonna we're not gonna ex- announce exactly what how those will look like. But keep plugging away; you're gonna get some more and more support. We're gonna get, increase that awareness and 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 hopefully overcome a lot of these uh, issues. So thank, thank you. Thank you. I really uh, it's been a pleasure speaking with you, and I really appreciate that you're interested in this topic, and um, hope that people just keep talking about it. Hundred percent. Thanks again. Thank you, everybody, for listening to our episode with Dr. Michelle Ward. That is such an important issue, and I hope everyone feels motivated to connect with others out there. How are those families doing? How are the kids doing? You know, this shit is too important. I want to thank our sponsors, Audible and BetterHelp. I want to thank our quadcast team, specifically the show notes crew and the social media crew. You guys do amazing work. Stay tuned for some of our webinars. We'll be releasing one or two a week just to keep you guys informed. There'll be links attached to the show notes. If you guys are interested in our merchandise, we're not this month. We're this month. Our proceeds are going to the food bank. So don't hesitate to get yourself some new merch. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, everyone else out there, just stay safe. Thanks for listening. We all appreciate what you do and let's stay connected.